Another application that I want to look at is related to IR spectroscopy. So it's kind of a subset where we look at metal carbonyls. Because metal carbonyls are really give a lot of information about molecules and it's really kind of a cool class of inorganic compounds. And they have intense IR stretches near 2000, which makes that gives them a great spectroscopic skit. It gives them a great spectroscopic handle to look at in the IR because there's not a lot of things in that region and they're very strong and intense absorptions. So it's, it's a great tool to look at what's going on in the molecule because the intensity of their shift, sorry, the intensity of the vibration, the number of vibrations, and where the vibration is, the energy level at which that vibration occurs, gives you a lot of information about the compound. Now free carbonyl or free CO occurs in the IR spectrum at 2143 wave numbers. But when you bind a CO to a molecule, so when you bind CO to a transition metal compound, we see a shift in the spectrum for the CO. So for example here, I want to look at vasca salt. And vasca salt is a very classic inorganic compound. So it's an iridium complex and you've got trans carbonyls and a chloride or a trans CO and a bromide here. But you also have triphenylphosphine ligands. So here's a picture of vasca salt. And you've got the triphenylphosphines and the iridium center. And there's your halide. And we also have a CO on the other side. So notice for these, the CO is at 1944-1947. So here the oxidation state of the iridium is a plus one. So the phosphine ligands neutral, the CO ligands neutral, the chloride's a minus one. So the oxidation state of the iridium is plus one. Now notice when we go to the these other two compounds at the bottom. So here the oxidation state of the iridium has gone from iridium plus one to plus three because the hydride's a minus one, each chloride's a minus one, the CO's still neutral, the phosphines are still neutral, so the iridium has a plus three oxidation state. So in this instance, the iridium is less electron rich. So if it's less electron rich, we don't see as large of a shift or of the CO from where it is the free CO. So what's going on here, remember if we look at the HOMO of the CO, so this is the highest occupied molecular orbital of CO. So we have a lot of electron density on the carbon and that can donate to the metal center. But we also have the LUMOS. Remember the lowest, so the LUMO is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital of CO. Now with a sigma bond, you, with the CO with the, using the HOMO, you can get the sigma bond as the carbonyl donates electron density to a metal orbital. But that metal can also back donate electron density using one of its uh, other d orbitals. So it's of the right symmetry to overlap and have a pi bond with the CO. So you have a metal carbon pi bond. We'll notice as the metal donates electron density onto the CO, to create this bond here is putting electron density into an antibonding orbital. So if it's putting electron density into an antibonding orbital, that's going to lower the bond order of the CO. So remember the CO is a triple bond, and if we lower the bond order, it's going to be less than three. So if it's less than three, it weakens the bond, and if it's a weaker bond, it takes less energy to vibrate the bond. So less energy means smaller wave numbers. So the iridium complex is here where there's plus three. The iridium is less electron dense, so you have less of this pi back bonding taking place. So you have less donation into the antibonding orbital. So the CO stretching frequently is shifted less for the iridium plus three than it is for the plus one, because the plus one is more electron rich and you have more of that pi back donation occurring. Now just to look at metal carbonyls, there's a couple of standard bonding modes. So this is a terminal mode where you have an indon binding of the CO, so you have the donation from the carbon to the metal. 
It can also bridge two metal centers, and we consider this a two electron neutral donor. And the carbonyl can also bridge multiple metal centers, such as this here, where we're bridging three metal centers. So this is still a neutral donor, but we consider this a three electron donor. So we'll come back to this idea of electron donor and how many electrons it's donating. We will get into the organometallic section of the course. So there are multiple ways that CO can bind. So there's lots of examples here, but the most important are is the terminal, the bridging two metal centers, and the bridging the three metal centers. So looking at some IR data, so this is for some neutral metal complexes. We, remember we said that the free CO comes in at 2143. Terminal modes generally curb in the range of 2120 to 1850. If we have a bridging two metal centers, these are typically lower in energy because think you've got two metal centers now to back donate, so adding even more electron density into the carbonyl. So this should, we expect it shifted to lower numbers. So this is, occurs typically between 1850 and 1720. And if you have three metal carbons, if you have three metal centers that the carbonyl is bridging, that shift is even further down to lower energy, so 1730 to 1500. So where the CO shows up in the IR can give you a lot of information about what the binding mode is of that carbonyl. So note that these ranges are typical for neutral transition metal complexes with an average amount of electron density on the metal center. And bridging carbonyls tend to have weaker and broader IR bands. So weaker meaning less intense. So related to the carbonyl IR stretching frequencies, first of all, the position of the carbonyl bands in the IR depends mainly on the bonding mode of the CO. So whether it's terminal or bridging, and the amount of electron density on the metal being pi back bonded to the CO. So the position of the carbonyl depends on the bonding mode, so how the CO is interacting with the metals. Is it terminal? Is it bridging? And also the amount of electron density on the metal being back bonded to the CO. So how much electron density is being donated into that antibonding orbital. So that determines what wave number that the, the CO stretching frequency appears. Now, the number of carbonyl bands and also the intensity of those bands is going, to, is going to depend on the number of CO ligands present and the symmetry of the metal complex. And there are also secondary effects such as the Fermi resonance and overtone interactions that can, that can complicate carbonyl IR spectra. But we're just going to mainly focus on how we can use symmetry and group theory to determine the number of CO bands that we should see. Now for this vascous complex or vascous salt, there's only one CO, so we would expect to only see one CO stretch in the IR. And if we have two COs bound to the metal center, we would typically see, generally two CO stretches are seen in the IR. So you'd have this symmetric and also the anti-symmetric stretch or the asymmetric stretch. So there's two ways that those COs can stretch. And using this formula, so if there's two COs bound to the metal center, you can use the ratio of the intensity of the symmetric stretch over the asymmetric stretch. And you can find the angle between the carbonyls and the metals. So the angle that's between these carbonyls, you can calculate using the ratio of the intensity of the symmetric stretch over the intensity of the asymmetric stretch. Now, if your angle, if these are 180 degrees from each other, if that takes place, you'll only see one peak in the IR because the symmetric stretch will cancel each other out. So you have no net change in the dipole moment. So you'll only see one stretch in the IR uh, because uh, those are 180 degrees from each other. Now if the, 
the theta or the angle is 90 degrees, then that ratio is going to be 1. So the symmetric and the anti-symmetric stretch would have equal intensity. But if this angle is 180, that ratio is defined, undefined. That's because you only see one peak in the um, in the spectrum because the asymmetric stretch now in lab we typically do a synthesis where we make a molybdenum tricarbonyl species with a mesitylene ligands we start off with molybdenum hexacarbonyl and we react it with mesitylene to make this piano stool type complex and if we find the point group of this molecule, we'll find that it's C3V. And we can describe the CO stretching frequencies. So we, we produce a reducible representation for the CO stretches. Now, because we're only interested in the stretches of the CO, we don't have to use the individual vectors for each molecule. So we don't have to have three vectors for the carbon, three vectors for the oxygen, because we're only interested in the CO stretches. So what we do is we think about having just one vector for the carbon oxygen. So we have, let me just draw a little vector there. So we draw a vector for each one of those stretches. And we create a reducible representation for each of those vectors because we're only interested in the CO stretches. We don't have to worry about other bending modes or other modes of vibration. We only want the CO stretches. So when I do the E operation, so do nothing, each of those vectors stay the same. So I get plus one, plus one, plus one. So it's a total of three. If I do a C3 rotation, all of those vectors move. The butts of the vectors move. So each one of those gets a zero. And if I do one of the mirror planes, so let's say I use the mirror plane that contains this middle CO. Well, the COs on either side trade places, so those move, so those both get zero, but the one contained within the plane gets a plus one. So my reducible representation is represented by a three, a zero, and a one. So this is a fairly simple uh, reducible representation. And if I looked at my character table, I could see that the uh, the E and the A1 add up to give me my reducible representation because 2 plus 1 is 3 and minus 1 and plus 1 and gives me 0 and 0 and 1 give me a total of 1. Now if you can't do that by inspection, you can go ahead and factor out the irreducible representations from the reducible representations like we've done in the previous slides. So you should get the exact same answer. So there's one A1, there's no A2s, and there's one E. So the A1 means that there's one stretch, and that occurs at 1961 wave numbers. So this is a symmetric stretch, where they're all stretching in the same direction. The E means that there are two stretches, and so they're degenerate. So there's two things that occur at the same wave numbers. So there's two types of modes. So this E stretch, where we have one stretching in one direction and two contracting at the same time, and then we have the CO here that's staying the same. And then these two COs are in opposite mode. So one's stretching while the other's contracting. So these occur at the same energy value. So these both have wave numbers of 1876. So they're degenerate. So we still have three modes of vibration. It's just two of these are degenerate. So that's why we see the two peaks in the IR for the CO stretches. Now, if you have three COs bound to metal, you can use this formula to determine the angle between them. So it's the ratio of the symmetric to the anti-symmetric peak. And this is one of the things that you'll actually calculate in lab. So this is some example data, so the symmetric peak and the anti-symmetric peak. So the symmetric peak occurs at 1961. And rather than finding the intensity of the peak, we measure the area under the curve. And 
that is 9.254. And our anti-symmetric peak occurs at 1876. And the area under this curve is 18.452. So remember, this is our ace, this is our symmetric stretch, our A1, and these are our two degenerate peaks. So this is our anti-symmetric peak right here. So using this formula, we can actually calculate the angle between the carbonyls based on the area under these curves. Now, because the intensity is related to the area, when we put in the values for here, we actually use the area of the symmetric curve over the area of the anti-symmetric curve. And you get the same information as if you use the intensity, but the area is actually easier to determine on the spectrometer. So this concludes this portion of looking at symmetry as it applies to infrared and Raman spectroscopy.